Good morning. Thank you very much for showing up. Um, for some reason, the, I don't hear the speaker here, but um, I'm hoping that online you are hearing it. If somebody can verify, please. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, it's 8.36 now. Let's start. Um, we have a couple of announcements that we would share with you today. Um, one major thing, um, uh, the uh, volume of the award last uh, fiscal year was basically the same as the year before, which was a record number, huge number. The year before was 847 million. This past year, we were at 846 million. So basically the same number. And remember that uh, two years ago, that was a huge jump. So researchers, our campus are doing great job and we are really happy to be a part of their success. It's all of their work which makes this happen. And we are very happy to be a part of it and uh, facilitate uh, their moving forward. So everybody is hoping for the next big number, which um, I guess you are reaching UCLA and uh, San Francisco and San Diego. They are over 1 billion, so hopefully soon. Uh, with that, um, the first presentation we have um, has to do with the new NIH rules regarding um, human fetal uh, tissue. But before doing that, since our vice, uh, vice chancellor, associate vice chancellor, executive associate vice chancellor, I just, prom I just promoted her to vice chancellor. Our executive associate vice chancellor, Cindy Kyle, is here, and she has a tight schedule. Um, I would like her to give us some updates, if um, she would please. Thank you very much, Cindy, Vice Chancellor for research. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want my boss's job, so but th thanks anyway. Um, so uh, welcome, I'm glad you're here. Just some really quick announcements. Uh, you may have already heard, but in the Office of Research, uh, when it comes to our technology management uh, innovation Access Venture Catalyst areas. Uh, Dushant Pathak, our Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, uh, is going on to other things, I think, in the Bay Area. And so uh, his last day with us will be on Friday. Um, we, we will be going out for a national search, and our interim lead for those areas is going to be Bill Tucker, who is currently Director of IA. And so he'll be interim over that area. So. I just let you know about that transition. And also, I wanted to bring up uh, professional development opportunities. So we're really lucky that um, the SRA international meeting, their, their big international meeting, is going to be held in San Francisco at the end of October. This week or next week is the early bird registration closure. So please get in and get the advantage of uh, the lower registration rates by doing that this week. Uh, if you're interested in doing it, it you know, significantly lowers your cost because you don't have to buy plane tickets and things like that to get there because it's just right down the road for us. So that's uh, something I'd like to encourage people for professional development reasons. Um, also, Incura has a, it's one of their regional six, seven meetings and it's going to be in Seattle right during the same week as the SRA meeting. So if you prefer to travel <laughs> and go to the Incura meeting, that's a regional meeting um, in Seattle, then there's that opportunity too. So I wanted people to be aware of those. I'm sure registrations, well, I know registration um, cutoffs are coming up very soon. Um, I think the hotel in San Francisco is sold out, but um, they've opened up a, an alternate hotel as well. So thank you all. And if there's no questions. I don't know. Nothing here. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, again, I, I just mentioned uh, the new rule from notice from NIH regarding uh, use of uh, human fetal tissue and specifically uh, the tissue which has been obtained from elective uh, uh, surgeries, basically, uh, you know, elective abortion. Um, the previous rule is from 1990, 2016. 
2016 that talks about in general use of um, uh, uh, fetal tissue in research. The new rule, which my colleagues would um, explain, will become effective very soon. Um, specifically focuses on elective abortions. So some very major restrictions are coming down. Um, uh, Grace and Kelly, collectively Grace Kelly, they are, they are giving us a presentation on that from proposal and awards in our office. So who's going first? I'll go sit down. Good morning, everyone. Um, at the end of July, we became aware of some changes that were being made to the requirements concerning use of human fetal tissue. Um, before we start, I want to let everybody know that some of these slides have a lot of information and all of this information is on our website, so you can go back and reference it um, just to make it a little bit easier for you to follow along. Um, specifically, we were notified on July 26 that NIH is changing the requirements specific to human fetal tissue research. Um, that information is available on their website at this link. Uh, I should also mention that this entire PowerPoint is available online too, so you can easily access this link as well. Um, throughout this presentation, we're going to summarize what the NIH has mandated as, as far as the July 26 notice goes. Um, the really important thing for you to keep in mind when it comes to this July 26th notice regarding human fetal tissue is that these requirements apply specifically to uh, tissue obtained from elective abortions. Um, so specifically the study analysis or use of any primary human fetal tissue cells or their derivatives that are derived from elective abortions. Um, that also includes um, primary secondary cell cultures, any animal models that involve the use of human fetal tissue, um, derivative uh, products and extra embryonic cells and tissues such as um, cord tissue, cord blood, amniotic fluid, placenta, et cetera. Again, from the process of elective abortions. Um, what it does not include, it does not include um, human cell cultures, derivative products, or extra embryonic cells and tissues if not derived from elective abortions. Those are really um, key takeaways from this. Um, it also doesn't include um, fetal cells that are present in maternal blood or other maternal sources. Um, embryonic cell lines that um, have already been established or research on transplantation of human fetal tissue for therapeutic purposes. Um, again, uh, process of elective abortions and these go into effect for proposals that are submitted on or before September 25th. Again, due dates on or before September 25th. Um, what does this mean for the proposals process? It means that when you go into cut use, you're going to need to identify whether this project involves use of human fetal tissue. We have a specific question that again, kind of paraphrases NIH requirement. Um, it's going to be on the special interest page of CAIUSE under the proposals tab, and it's going to specifically ask you to identify whether the project involves um, use of any human fetal tissue cells or derivatives from the process of elective abortions. If the answer is yes, there's going to be some changes that you're going to need to make um, in your proposal uh, that is submitted to us. Um, the first requirement is that you're going to have to have a new header on um, the approach section of your research strategy. Specifically, you're going to have to address why the research goals can't be accomplished using some sort of alternative. You're going to have to describe the methods that you use to determine that there were no alternatives to using HFT. You're going to have to describe any literature review that was conducted to support your, your statement that there were no alternatives and provide justification. Uh, you're going to have to talk about how you're going to treat the HFT and how you're going to dispose of it. And you're gonna to have to describe the informed consent process. Um, and if it's already been obtained, provide documentation of how it was obtained. In the budget section, you're not going to be able to use modular budgets. You're gonna to have to use R&R budget form. 
you're going to have to have a line that specifically identifies that the cost for the human fetal tissue was zero dollars. Um, and it's really important to note that no valuable consideration can be given for any human fetal tissue that's derived from elective abortions. Um, and then again, in your budget justification, you're going to have to describe the quantity type and source of the human fetal tissue that was obtained, again, from elective abortions, as well as a certification that no valuable consideration was provided in exchange for the human fetal tissue. And then last but not least, as far as proposals go, um, the PI is going to have to have a letter um, from, on behalf of UC Davis, stating that the organization or clinic that has provided the human fetal tissue adheres to all of the requirements of the informed consent process. And again, certifying that there was no valuable consideration provided for obtaining the human fetal tissue. Um, all of this information is on our website already. Um, uh, in our compliance section, um, this presentation will also be uploaded for you as well. Um, and now we're going to turn it over to Grace to talk about the awards process. And I mentioned one thing on the informed consent process. Oh, okay. Just one thing on the informed consent process. It is a two-fold process, and it has to happen in a given sequence, or you are non-compliant. Oh, you yeah, are? Yeah. Okay, so then I will turn it over to Grace, and she'll finish that. Okay, thanks, Cindy. So this is part of the consent process that we're talking about for the award side. Once again, this is Grace Liu, Associate Director of the award side. If your award includes human, if an award for your NIH project is issued and your project contains human fetal tissues, after September 25th, we will require the consent letter as described on the screen. And not only do we need the informed consent, but we need the additional certifications in that letter. And these are the additional certifications that the informed consent for the donation of human fetal tissue was obtained by a different person than the person who obtained the informed consent for the elective abortion, that the informed consent for donation of human fetal tissue occurred after the informed consent for the elective abortion. That's the order Cindy was talking about that the informed consent for the donation of human fetal tissue will not affect the method of elective abortion, and that no enticements, benefits, or financial incentives were used to incentivize the elective abortion or the donation of the human fetal tissue. And that consent letter must be signed by two people, which is a woman giving consent and the person obtaining the informed consent. So yeah, the NIH has definitely ramped up the requirements for the informed consent in this area. And if your project does have human fetal tissue, we will work with you on getting the requirements put down in the letter and have it properly signed. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question, I guess. Let's see. Uh, my question has to do with, um, again, the requirements at the time of um, proposal, um, what would happen if a PI is planning to use uh, the affected uh, samples, but would tell us that I'm, I'm working on all of the documentations and I would have it to you in five weeks or something. Um, are we allowed to wait for just in time on these things or do we have to really hold the proposal uh, from going out? So from what I have read, NIH will not consider any proposals that do not include all of the required information at time of submittal. Okay, that's, that's very important to know. Um, so if the proposal doesn't have all of these requirements, it can't go out of the, the university. Clearly, we, we see the restrictions. They, you know, there is, um, I mean, no, all of the restrictions we are talking about having to do with elective abortion and all of these requirements, um, they have to be in place. Uh, otherwise, the proposal is not going to be reviewed. So please, please make sure that you are not uh, wasting your time putting a proposal together that in the last minute it cannot go out. Very important. That's what NIH is, um, is right now, and I highly doubt that they will change that. So. I would also add that NIH has stated that they're going to have an ethics committee reviewing these proposals. 
So it is going to go through um, another layer mm -hmm. in the review process. Any other questions? Cassie, do you see anything online? Uh, Cindy has something. Come on over, Cindy. Just so you know, one of the confusions in this area has to do with IRB review and approval of protocols. So, so when people hear the words informed consent, they usually think of IRB processes. Here, because human fetal tissue is not is considered to be tissue and the definition of conducting human subjects research is on a live being, right? And so because of the definition of human subjects, this kind of research may or may not go through an IRB protocol and be approved by the IRB. So it really is kind of a separate process that falls outside of kind of the human, uh, you know, subjects protection IRB process. So it's, it's one of the reasons why at the proposal stage, it's kind of like sponsored programs is the gatekeeper right now for this new initiative. Um, so just to keep that in mind is this could happen and you still need these informed consents even if you do not have an IRB protocol at play. So just wanted to make that clear. Mm -hmm. And again, to reemphasize, all of that has to be in our hands before proposal goes out. It's just we don't have any leeway on that at this point at least. It, you know. So we'll see what happens. Uh, if there are no questions, we can go to the next subject. Uh, UC Pat and Deborah Hen. Deborah was going to give us some updates. Um, you have websites you want to show? So show her first. Then. Thank you, Deborah. So yeah, can you just put our web page up? And then I'll just maneuver from there. So I just, um, I've been working a little bit with the UC PATH team and um, wanted to make sure that the campus CNG users, is the, all of our research administrators, were getting good information about what they need to do to prepare for UC PATH from the departmental, you know, where, hey, we're processing payroll standpoint. So um, I've put together, if you go to our web page, this is the main contract and grants accounting page. I've added a resource here for um, how to get ready for UC Path. And I just wanted to kind of run through what's on this table. Um, obviously the first thing is making sure that your folks who are doing the payroll setup and your folks who have to do cost transfers have the right access to the system. So getting those permissions in. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on most of these. Um, but we want to make sure that everybody gets trained in the, the immediate time frame so that when the data is converted, folks are ready to take a look at that data and make sure that it's correct before we start running payroll against it. Um, I understand that there have been some improvements to the conversion program, but I believe there still will be errors in how people's pay is distributed. So uh, especially for your... Um, high earners, your, your PIs who make over the salary cap or PIs who have uh, split appointments, PIs who have um, nine over nine appointments that are not the norm anymore. Uh, those folks we want to review their distributions, which is uh, in the funding entry screen in UC Path. Want to make sure that we're reviewing those um, and our time frame is going to be limited because the conversion is supposed to be complete and the system available on August 20. And the first payroll run, we're going to be cut off. So, oh, thank you. September 20. Uh, that's what happens when I don't look at my notes. The first payroll run um, will be cut off on the 25th. So we've only really got five days, and two of those are in the weekend. So um, you want to make sure that you gather your troops, you get ready to review the distributions. There will be a report available, I believe on, um, on the 18th was the information that I got this morning. Um, the, the funding entry report will be available for people to start reviewing on the 18th. And then um, folks will need to be ready to fix their funding distributions if necessary before the payroll cutoff on the 25th. So we don't have a lot of time. There is a, um, an extra day for the biweeklies. The biweeklies won't be cut off until the 26th. 
but um, we want to make sure that that people are getting not only the right paychecks, but that it's getting distributed correctly to the ledger because afterward, our only recourse is going to be to do salary cap or salary transfers, sorry, cost transfers. And um, the other thing that I wanted to, here, are they seeing? Questions going there? Sure, yeah. Can you just go back? Can I go back there? I can't get, there we go, there's a button. Okay, so this is the Contracts and Grants Accounting homepage. Oops, over here. Nope. Oh, back up one more, sorry. Yeah, you're right. There we go. Okay, contracts and grants accounting homepage. So it's it's finance and business. Can I move this, Kelsey? How do I move the top bar? Back, but they can't. But they, it's funny, they can see it. They don't see it like that. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So it's finance and business.ucdavis.edu slash finance slash contracts grants accounting with hyphens in between each word in the last section. Um, and then if you scroll down, there's a um, quick links box on the right hand side that says get ready for UC Path. And all the instructions are in there. Um, let's see where have I not gone over everything here. So we want to be checking the funding entries. Once the first pay run is done, we want to carefully check everybody's pay and make sure that it's being distributed out to the right accounts. Um, one of the things that UC Path will do is it will, uh, anything that it can't figure out what to do with, it will throw into a default account with a different sub account based on the type of error it incurred. So those default accounts, each department's going to have their own unique default account. This default account needs to need to be cleaned out um, just like you would with your, um, your P card accounts. You have one account everything goes into, you need to clean it out every month and put it to where it's supposed to go. So these accounts will be similar to that, that you need to keep them clean. And I've got a suggestion in here that Dean's offices may want to oversee that as well as um, the department leads may want to oversee that those accounts are being cleaned out. Um, the salary cost transfers, as I said, are the going to be the main mechanism for fixing things after the fact. Um, we have, there is a mention on here of uh, fixing funding entries. Um, historically, when we make salary cost transfers, going back and updating the funding entry so that they're accurate, that will facilitate merit increases, hitting the correct account where the pay ended up rather than the pay where it was initially distributed. Um, there's a question as to whether that is really going to happen or not. So um, if that changes, then we will update this document immediately on finding that information out. But um, th so this document's available on the website. Um, I want to stress that the contracts and grants accounting staff are not experts in UC Path. We do not have uh, most of our users, only three or four people in our office have even had access to look at UC Path. So if you have questions and you need help with um, HR and payroll problems, you want to contact your service channel and there's a link on the, the web page to get you to the right service channel. If you have questions about funding entry, how to do funding entry entries, how to get training on funding entries, and the same for cost transfers, if you need help doing them, if you need help learning about them, um, if you need help with a specific cost transfer or a specific funding entry, you need to contact ucpath at ucdavis.edu, and that's on the, the sheet at the top here. So, can you point? There are several questions coming in. You have to, five questions. Questions, questions, questions. So in addition, um, we have Rhonda Wilbur here, who is the lead for the change management group for UC Path. And the, she's got some materials in the back of the room for folks who are interested in those materials. And those, I believe, Rhonda, are available on the UC Path website as well. Great. Questions? So what about 339 or PTSDS? Um, that report has been developed. Um, 
we've done a couple of rounds of um, review on that and it's my understanding is that it is being um, has been already fixed and will be ready to go on day one okay anybody here have questions go ahead Yes. Question. Yeah. Hold on. I just got some new information this morning. Oh, sorry. The question was, do we have information about training? And um, I got some information this morning. I'm going to read you off my email here. If I can, without my reading glasses. Training for departmental users. Um, courses are in the process of being published. Funding entry content should be published by 830. Salary cost transfer content will be published next week. Um, so 8.30 is this week, and then the cost transfers next week. E-learning courses and step-by-step -step quick reference guides are available on the training resources page. Um, that, so if you go to UC Path, go to training, and then there's a link for training resources. Um, there are already some resources out there, including a step-by-step um, -step that walks you through how to do a funding entry um, document and how to do a salary cost transfer document. Um, what else do I need out of here? E-learning will be assigned to all users with security roles for funding entry and salary cost transfers. If someone completes the e-learning before it is assigned to them, they will still get credit. Um, and then I, my understanding is that if you, you will, if you have the permission assigned, you will have a certain amount of time, and I don't know what time frame it was, four weeks or a month or so, um, to complete the training. And if you don't complete the training in that time, then your permissions will be reversed or revoked. Um, the schedule for webinars and um, there were office hours as well, lab time and office hours so that you could go in and, and do hands-on questions and answers. Um, the schedule will be published next week. Webinars will start the week of 9-16 it looks like and continue through October. Uh, the webinars are not training, but planned more as a Q&A. Attendees should take the training before going to the webinar or joining the webinar. Lab time will start the week of 923. Most of the lab sessions will be at um, base camp at Cousteau, so everybody knows or that is off of Second Street. Um, and they plan to have some lab sessions for the health system uh, in either ASB or the education building. They don't have those finalized yet. So there's a list of courses. Um, I'm assuming that's all available on the UC Path website as well. Um, but there's courses on funding entry and salary cost transfers, which is what most of our folks are, are mainly concerned with. So um, there's also going to be a document that will kind of guide our, our types of folks, our funding entry and, and cost transfer users through the trainings that they need. So there'll be a list of, you know, do this, do this, do this training. And uh, hopefully everyone will find that helpful. But um, your CNG staff over at King's Contracts and Grants Accounting, um, we're going to try really hard to get our folks to redirect you to the UC Path experts because we are, as I said, not expert in any of this. So with that, and if there are no more questions, then I think I'm done. I will hand it off to James for some other announcements. James Ringo, Manager of Contracts and Grants Accounting. Thank you. So yeah, that, that, um, hopefully that was helpful information. We just wanted to just use this uh, forum as a, as a venue for sharing some of the stuff that the, really the UC Path team uh, put those, that information largely together based on some questions that we had uh, that, that we wanted to understand how things were going. Um, I want to mention as far as the transition into UC Path, you will still have access to doing SETs um, and RX LX entries. We believe the cutoff for that will be February 28th. So there's not 29th, 29th. That's is that leap year? Okay, apparently. I still go with the 28th. So, um, uh, so that was just one other little comment there. Um, also, somewhat related, I suppose, is that um, the uh, 
the new composite benefit rate approval letter has been posted to our website. So if you need to have a copy of the formal approval, it is out there. So that's that. And then I've got just one other thing, and I just wanted to let, um, let you know and request any feedback that, that you might have. We're trying to streamline some of our processes. And one thing we're looking at is consolidating some of the sub-fund groups that we use. One place that we have a whole bunch of sub-fund groups that we don't really use internally in contracts and grants accounting anymore is in the state agreements. We've got about, I think there's 16 different sub-fund groups that we use to say, you know, it's uh, California Department of Food and Ag and California, you know, Caltrans and this and that. And is it federal flow through or is it not? Um, centrally, we aren't using that. None of the other central offices seem to be using that. Uh, we're planning to just have one sub-fund group that we'd use for direct state funding and one sub-fund group that we would use for uh, federal flow-through funding through the state. Call it good, because that would take care of all of the reporting requirements that we need. But before I do that, I just want to put that bug in everyone's ear. If anybody is actually using those sub-fund groups for anything internal in your departments, could you just send me a note and let me know how you're using those so we can figure out if there's a different way that you could accomplish the same thing. Um, I've got a suspicion that there aren't a lot of people using it for very much. Um, Cassie, is anybody saying, oh my God, you can't possibly do that. That's going to blow up. Okay. No. Nope. <laughs> I've got two different speeds going. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. I see. You seem to be okay at this point. Okay. All right, well, hopefully everybody will not mind us doing that and will make things a little bit easier on our side and, and cut down maybe on a little bit of confusion on our setups and things. Uh-oh, I see a finger. I mean. The suggestion for improvement. So uh, communication with SPO, new allocations are still taking more than a month from the time we approve it for towards to the allocation of the fund. Okay, so if, to the allocation of the fund, so I'm assuming that means the putting the budget on the, doing the appropriation. Can they just say yes, that's what they mean? Okay, <laughs> just, <laughs> just wanna make sure. So, okay, so I, I you know, that, that does seem like a pretty long stretch of time. Our key turnaround is getting that award set up the first thing is we, when we get the, the award from sponsored programs, we set up the award in KFS. That then triggers the note to the department to say, okay, now you can create your account. So if that all happens fairly quickly, we should be able to put the budget on the books, you know, within a few days of getting the account back. We're trying to, you know, nail down some additional process improvements. We're continually trying to find uh, ways to do that. Uh, a month sounds kind of, excessive so if you run into places where you're not seeing things hit the hit your account um, in a timely manner you send me an email so I can take a look and see what's going on um, Deborah oh, co completely De Deborah's saying that should be the exception and not the rule there occasionally there are going to be things where we can't put the budget in because there's something's gone screwy somewhere along the way and we don't really have the data that we need in order to put it in um, but you know most of the time, it should it should be. Or, okay, I, th I thought you were going to say something else. Okay, okay, okay. Th thank you. Okay, you are off the hook. Thank you. Put some budgets. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see some updates from proposals. Kelly, it seems like you are on the list here for some updates. Just, just one. Okay. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that if they have a TINI agreement or a CDA or NDA that they need to enter into, please email those directly to our negotiation team as opposed to submitting them through Cayuse. It can cause some confusion and delays when we get it and we think it's for a proposal. Thank you. That's only for... CDAs, NDAs, and TINI agreements. It, yeah, it's nothing else. No proposals Correct. or anything. No proposals. So hopefully there's no confusion there. Yeah. And MTAs are not in a sponsored program, so MTAs should not come here. It should go to take transfer. Correct. They do have their own websites, and experts there would do the MTA. So it's CDAs for only in preparation of discussions of research. 
there are um, CDAs are done around the campus in different places. So uh, sponsored programs only is responsible for CDAs and NDAs, which uh, are to facilitate discussions before we are entering into research. So for example, if the discussions have to do with uh, uh, you know, getting a license, for example, it has to go to tech transfer, it's not a sponsored program. So, but if you have questions, we can help you navigate to the right place. Thank you. Seems like James is standing, he has something. Hello, James. International. <laughs> okay, so what about international agreements? We were asked to submit our international agreements through SPO, but they are not research related. Who wants to take that one? I'll take it. Okay. Uh, well, that's a very you know, unique area. It, you know, it depends on how you define international um, research or international agreements. If we are talking about, for example, um, a company from Japan is funding research here in UC Davis, that's business as usual. It is um, in sponsored programs. You send a proposal through, we go through the process, we, you know, we work on an agreement and uh, uh, the research would start after that. But if you are talking about like, you know, international agreements, for example, for exchanging faculty, for uh, having a relationship between department X or college Y with a uh, university in whatever country. None of that is in our office. Those are either in the relevant dean's office or the global affairs. So if you are not talking about doing research, it's not in our office, most probably it's in global affairs. We work together very closely because there are some situations that there's a combination of the two and we work together to make the agreements work. But if it is, you know, again, pure research, it's in our office. If it is exchange of students, exchange of uh, researchers, uh, uh, MOUs for uh, generally saying that we, you know, we would like to work together between universe, our university and other universities especially, those are all in global affairs. Hopefully that answers the question. But case by case, again, you no, know, there are some, I mean, these things are definitely not black and white. If there are questions, we would always be here to help you. Send us an email and we'll tell you where we have to go. Does it? Good, thank you. Any other questions? We don't have anything else to, as far as the updates. And remember these uh, sessions, the way originally they were designed were for you from the campus to ask questions and hopefully we would answer them. So uh, if there's no other questions, it seems like this is going to be a very short meeting. 30 seconds. Why don't you do that? Cassie wants to make one more announcement, I guess. We also have Randa Wilbur, Wilbur here from UC Path. So if anyone has questions for her, now would be a good time. And we'll provide a link to some of the materials she has too. So if you have any UC Path questions, feel free to ask them. So how much time are you giving them to ask questions? <laughs> it's, I mean, no, this is, you know, UC Path, you know, from what I have seen, learned and all of that, it's obviously a very complicated, uh, uh, system to put in place and it's amazing what the team is doing, what they have done and how very smoothly it's going forward. So it, it just, I mean, it's a huge you know, transformation and it's, it's doing great. I don't know if you want to say anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll take just a few more minutes because I'm in between you and getting back to your work. So I'll be sensitive to that. Um, just a couple of things about UC PATH dates and things that are coming up that I wanted to emphasize. First of all, next Thursday is the last day that anybody can go into AYSO and make any changes in AYSO. And we're asking that you please make sure that all of your information is accurate 
after next Thursday, whatever's in there is going to be transferred and cut over into UC Path. That's particularly important if anybody is still getting a paper paycheck, that their home address is accurate because after the 27th, which is when we get access, right? Um, anybody that's still on a paper paycheck, in fact, the deadline's already passed. Anyone that's already getting a paper paycheck, they can no longer pick it up at their department because we're not cutting checks here locally. The checks are going to be cut in Arizona by a third party, ADP, and then however long it takes to get the paycheck through the mail, that's how long it's going to take. And from Arizona to here, it could be three to five days. So please let your people know and any of your colleagues know that if they're getting a paper paycheck, it's going to take longer for them to actually receive the paycheck unless they sign up for a direct deposit. Well, so because we're now in cutover, cut, you cannot sign up for direct deposit until after we go live on the 27th. And then it takes a little bit of processing time to set up those bank accounts, et cetera. So just wanted everybody to know that the last day is next Thursday. Um, I have some materials in the back of the room that may be helpful for you. They're all on the website. One is a master cutover calendar that tells you everything that's happening, when it's happening, when the freezes are, when, when you can submit people for recruitment, when you can't, et cetera, et cetera. And all the pay dates are on that calendar. There's also a handout called, Who Do I Call If I Have a Problem? Directing people to either their department or their local service channel. When do you call the UC Path Center directly, which is primarily for benefits questions. And also in the future, once we go live, there will be the UC Path online help button, and which will open a ticket. So that's a handout in the back of the room. And we think that that might be helpful to people as well. There is also a, a sheet that says everything that's changing, what's new, what's changing, what's not changing, that's also available in the back of the room. So just wanted you to be aware of that information. If you haven't gone to the UC Path at UC Davis website yet, that is the best source of information. And whatever you want to know, there's probably answers there. Just use a keyword in the search bar and there's lots of articles, hands out, information, et cetera. You can also email us and your questions will be answered if you email us at ucpath.ucdavis at edu. Dot com. So, no, no, dot edu. <laughs> Sorry, not dot com. That's my Gmail address. <laughs> so, um, just wanted to, to share that information with you. Are there any specific questions in the room first about UC Path? Yes, so if you have uh, salary cost transfer or funding entry questions, go to that email address that I just mentioned and that Deborah mentioned, but in the subject line, put, please put GL question. So the people who are, who are um, supporting that help desk know to transfer it directly to our GL subject matter experts. It'll just expedite things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, in terms of training, I just wanted to add to the information that Deborah gave you. There are five e-learning online courses that are available for GL, for cost, salary cost transfers and funding. Two of them are required for anybody that has access to UC Path and is doing that work. You will be given to October 1st to complete the training, then you'll get a gentle reminder and then I think they'll set a hard deadline before they remove access, but they'll work with you if you're having scheduling difficulties. Total, all five, Courses only take two hours to complete total, so it's it's not that much. That's but but it will be very helpful. Good questions in the room. One in the back. So for the next deposit, what is the expected turnaround um, that we can meet with our students? Right. So could you um, repeat the question? Yes. Yeah, so the so the question is, what's the turnaround time for setting up a direct deposit account? Right. So we have been um, putting notices in anybody that receives a paper paycheck, we've been encouraging them to sign up for a direct deposit since last January. But I 
had a town hall meeting last night at eight o'clock and a gentleman came up to me and said, I signed up yesterday. When will I get my direct deposit? Well, September is cut over. So it's like, it's going to be hard to get that through given all of the other cutover activities. So my best guess is that um, anyone who signs up for a direct deposit, would you, you, ha you can't sign up now until UC Path goes live, which is on the 27th. It generally takes about a month. But the UC Path Center is telling us that they are processing those requests on a daily basis. So we are optimistic that it's going to be a lot faster than that. We just can't guarantee it. Thank you for the question. Others, please. So the question is, as we go live, you can have up to three direct deposit accounts, which is new. So if you want to add one, I think it's the same delay time because it'll be a different financial institution and they'll need to set it up with your financial institution. But again, they're working on processing those very quickly. Current state, it takes about a month. Future state, we're hoping will be faster. Yes. Any questions online? So the first question is, will individuals that require training be contacted directly? Will individuals who require training, so are we talking about individuals and departments who are doing funding entry and salary cost transfer or other kind? So that's primarily what we're thinking of. Yes, you will be contacted directly. You want me to come over here? Okay, I gotta, sorry, I gotta move. Okay, <laughs> you stay near me, okay? okay. Hi. <laughs> so um, on September the 2nd, an email is going out informing people who, are get, who have been appointed by their departments to be the representative for GL funding, uh, salary cost transfers funding entry. And I've been told that those people should already know who they are, but on, on September 2nd, there's a confirmation letter going out. And in that letter, there'll be information about training. Now, the training, the GL training is already posted on the website. So if you go to the UC Path website under training resources, all of the training is going to be listed there. Our training lead told me last night, she's going to set up a separate area on the website that just lists specific to department GL users what the training is that you need to take. And of course, it's because it's an online learning program, it's already in the LMS system. Yeah. Okay, so who do we contact if we need Cognos access? <laughs> Not me. <No. laughs> yeah, so you know, this has been a real diff this has been a real challenge just finding out. So the security user role team and the reports teams went out to the departments and said, who in your departments needs Cognos access? It's changing on a daily basis. So the accuracy of the list that we got back um, is, is changing all of the time. So um, that information is going to be published about September the 2nd, along with the GL user roles. And if you find that someone has been missed, all you have to do is let Leslie Olson or Courtney Finn know they're the ones that are working on this. Just send them an email and they will look into it and, um, and contact your department to see if a change needs to be made. One more and I'm mm -hmm. going to go check again. Mm -hmm. So will the first check be direct deposited? That depends. It depends on when you signed up for a direct deposit. <laughs> so if you have direct deposit now, you don't have to worry about anything unless you want to set up two extra ones, right? But if you have not yet signed up for a direct deposit, you can't do it until UC Path goes live. And then it could take up to a month, but we're hoping that it will be faster. So people who are getting paper paychecks right now and who have not signed up for direct deposit prior to the cutoff date, then your paychecks will be mailed to your home address at least the check on October 1st and the checks on October 2nd, so for bi-weekly and monthly, those will go to your home address. For monthlies, we're hoping that by the November, 
um, a paycheck that that direct deposit will be activated. For biweekly, it may take one more paycheck. We're just not sure. Yeah, it never is. So when you're onboarded and you sign up for a direct deposit, it takes a while to process it. So my understanding is when we were hired and signed up for direct deposit, the first paycheck may have to be a paper paycheck. It depends upon when you're onboarded in that pay cycle. So it depends. I'm sorry, it's not a very clear answer, but probably not. Good questions. I have a question regarding uh, like the estate agent. Yes. I'm a son of that, and I have been using it since the first bank card ages ago. Yes. Um, and my husband goes through withdrawals for the last several months. <laughs> 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 I don't need to. Uh, could I be a psychic at like 27 and use it from like the operating room? So AYSO is freezing to us for any changes next Thursday you can still go into AYSO to get all of your historical or hysterical background information. <laughs> so your previous pay statements will still be in AYSO. Your previous tax um, and W-2 records will still be in AYSO. And you'll still go to AYSO for any retirement information. After September 27th, when we go live, if you uh, have questions about your pay, your benefits, uh, taxes, et cetera, it will be you, we will use UC Path for that. So historical records and retirement will be retained in AYSO. I think, I, I don't know because I'm not an AYSO expert, but my understanding is AYSO is also going through a conversion to a new system called UC Path Raise, and that's going to happen in the month of September along with the cutover to UC Path. And I actually went into um, AYSO yesterday to print a, a a, a copy of my last pay statement. We encourage you all to do it to make sure that when we go live, your deductions and your pay rate are accurate. But I looked for information and it wasn't there for me either. I think it's because they're they're cutting over to UC Pathways. That's my guess. In the middle of the so you can submit a question about that to our help desk, to the UC Path, and they will forward it to the people who are working on that and get you an answer. Yes. <laughs> It's just an upgrade. It's gotten a facelift. Uh, the repeat the question. So are there changes to the timekeeping systems? All of the timekeeping systems will remain the same. TRS just went through a facelift. So it's going to look a little different. It's going to function exactly the same. The, the uh, deadlines are the same for uh, people to submit their timesheets. Mm -hmm. um, and just... Uh, uh, in case you want to know, deadlines after September 27th are real deadlines. And uh, we just can't warn people enough about that because we are not processing things here locally. We put the information in and then it goes to Riverside, California. So if someone misses a deadline for submitting their timesheet, we can't do anything about it locally. It's already in process down in Riverside so if, you know, they, they, they will not get paid. Now, we can take some emergency measures, but we can't fix timesheets or submit timesheets after the deadlines. Please. Yes, the question is, is there auto approval to avoid anybody not getting paid because their supervisor missed the approval deadline? And the answer to that is yes. 
in the new system, if your supervisor misses their deadline, you will still get paid. The system will automatically approve your timesheet. Um, there is an option, however, for supervisors who, you know, life happens, right? <laughs> who may be on vacation or whatever can delegate their approval authorities either for one period or for multiple periods to someone else in their department. Good, good questions. Anything else online? Well, thank you, and I'm very sorry to keep you in your meeting longer, but those were great questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see, there are no more questions online. Uh, nothing else here. It's 9.30. So I guess we get together next month.